The coup that occurred in, in 2016 basically required similar support from the U.S. And we know now, thanks to very recent reporting, I think it was like 2019, 2020, that all of this started coming out in The Intercept, um, that the U.S. was pretty much hand in hand with this coup. Yeah. Right? So, okay, 2014, two years prior to the coup. Federal, I, we're not going to get into the weeds about this because it's a little complicated, but I'm going to try and do my best to kind of give a overarching summary so okay. we can kind of, and hopefully move through it as quick as I can. But federal investigations begin into corruption dealings at Petrobras. Now, Petrobras is one of Brazil's state-owned uh, oil company. Yeah. Right. It's the lar- I think it's we one of the. Those. I think it's the largest state-owned company. Okay. Okay. But not private, state-owned. Um, these hearings, people may have heard, were called Operation Car Wash. Mm-hmm. Lava Jato. You know. You know. You know exactly what to insert there, right, Janjanski? Working at the car wash. Oh my. Um. For a year, these investigations were basically only really ostensibly focused on uh, Petrobras. Uh, and it was, you know, who at the company higher up were were kind of giving and receiving bribes. Now, culturally, corruption as a, like, political bugaboo, yeah. it has, like, a big place in Brazilian political history for yeah. a lot of reasons that we really don't have time to get into, even though we know I know this is going along anyway. Um, but so just kind of understand that. And it's a real middle class. It's like that classic middle class. Like we want to get corruption out. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, and there's a lot of reasons why, you know, know, again, the structure of the, the Brazilian parliamentary and presidential system, like we were talking about, it thrives on political coalitions, which means like paying a lot of people and people kind of creating their own parties and just being electors. And then also, like I was kind of saying about the, you know, with the the import of bourgeois society onto a slave society, mm-hmm. right? That the kind of uh, this is like social, uh, the kind of bourgeois social norms that we t- that we kind of take for granted, but we don't think about, but that come with the bourge- classic bourgeois revolutions in Europe and in you know somewhat in America, like we're not fully socially integrated and politically integrated in Brazil because they were not homegrown; they were also imported, mm-hmm. right? Um, so there's a lot of reasons for that. Anyway, in 2015, April 2015, the federal investigators and the presiding judge, remember this name, Sergio Moro, they basically focused their attention away from Petrobras and onto the PT. Yes. Uh, the treasurer of the party is the first to get brought down. And then two of the largest, uh, you know, two of the heads at the uh, largest construction company that they basically are seen as receiving bribes from PT. Yeah. You know, getting sweetheart deals, development deals. Um, PT now is getting portrayed by an increasingly insane media as, like, corrupt through and through. through. Like, the way the media is is uh, showing Dilma, by the way, is completely psychotic and misogynist, by the way. But they're calling her, they're like, she's crazy. She's, like, doing these wheezes and deals. She's a witch. She's blah, blah. Yeah, it yeah, was like, yeah. she's the most soft-spoken woman you've ever seen in your life. Like, it is such a complete and total, like, just fake reality, yeah. you know? And now there's starting to be protests in the street in support of Moro and punishing the PT. It's kind of difficult to overstate how big of a he- political scandal this was because it was being fueled so much by the media. And a lot of that was because Moro was such a fucking star. He was an incredible, incredible, incredible smooth operator. I yes. mean, I remember when this he's was young. going down. He's young. He's good looking. Sergio Moro is a, sounds like a musician. Like, sounds like a fake name. Like, exactly. It sounds like yeah. a, yeah. You know, more of a wind. And uh, he, yeah, he really like, I mean, he played, he played the media so fucking well in this. And they were happy to play along too. Yeah. I mean, he's like feeding them targeted leaks very early on to get the media to start associating Dilma with corruption, like examples of corruption at Petrobras. Like beginning all the way in 2014, 
he's, which by the way is illegal for a presiding judge to give media information. And he was just going on like all yeah, the time, yeah, running like, his it, fucking mouth. Take it, take mouth. it, take it, take it, take it. And after two years of leaking a bunch of innuendo to the press that they ran with, they still couldn't come up with anything real that Dilma did. Mm -hmm. And what she ends up getting impeached on is like, quote unquote, fiscal peddling, which is like not an impeachable offense. And then the Senate legalized it one week after she was removed from office. Fiscal peddling? Yeah, it's total bullshit. But What, like DoorDash? Moro didn't. What's interesting about what Moro did is that he didn't just arrest construction industry like insiders that he found guilty uh -huh. for bribing politicians and all of that. He basically forced that company and the five biggest construction companies in Brazil to halt all of their projects, which caused 500,000 people to lose their jobs. Okay, so I see where this is going, right? Mm. So you've got Dilma sort of under fire for all of these so-called shady deals or whatever she that haven't been proven. Mm -hmm. It was never able, like you know that. No, it's but not. like you know she's 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 been like harangued in the media and you know about a lot of like construction industry stuff too, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have at the same time construction industry basically halting all these people losing their jobs. Public anger is going to even more focus on to Dilma and the PT. Yes, I mean. That move that Moro did, which is also, by the way, it's hard to see that outside of any kind of like forced, um, like recessionary move, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's estimated, the BBC estimated that it dropped Brazil's GDP, that move alone by 2.5%. That's how big the halting of all of those construction projects and those development projects was. And that it that move alone tripled the effects of the Brazilian recession. Wow. Which is yeah. just, I mean, it's like, you know, to use a brace word, it's astounding. Um, Do I be saying that? Yeah, I, it's really cute. I love when you say it. It reminds me of Draymond Green because I think he says it's a lot. You know, I hope No, he says get... that that's incredible. This I, is I incredible. Say incre I say incredible a lot too. Yeah. I will say that's not the first time I've been, for, been compared to Draymond. I get the Draymond thing a lot and it's actually honestly kind of bugs me. You are a baller. It's true. Mm -hmm. In March of 2016, I'm tall. <laughs> you are. In March of 2016, uh, Sergio Moro he moves in not just on Dilma. Uh huh. Now he's focusing on Lula. Lula. Lula, who is not in office. Yeah. But still remains even outside of that very popular. Mm -hmm. Okay. My name when I was if my if I was born to be a, a girl, if I was born to be a girl was going to be Lulu. So I feel really? some, yeah, it was gonna be, I was gonna be Lulu. Wait, spelled how? L U L U. Oh, Lulu. Okay. Lulu. That was gonna be my name. My friend's kid is named Lou, but L O U. That's why I asked. Oh well, that's a regular. That's a name for a guy. Yeah, but this one, anyway. Um. Okay. So March 2016, they the the federal police bring in Lula for questioning in the early hours of the morning. Uh, right in front of cameras. Perp walk. Total perp walk. I mean, yeah. it was psycho. Yeah, like hundred um, percent. I mean, that's pretty common in any police force or whatever. Like there are informant, not inform. I guess it would be informants, but there are members of basically every police force in yeah. every country in the world who have a paid relationship with the press. Where they're like, hey, this important person's going to come in, come take a picture. But blah, it blah. was such a stunt. That's going to say this. This though, you know, this came from the top. Yes. Um. Uh, Moro tapped Lula's phone and released to the press a call that happened from Lula to Dilma about that basically he was like, you should appoint me chief of staff. Now, the thing to know about Brazil is that members of the government have immunity from prosecution while they are like still members of the government unless the, it goes to the Supreme Court and which, they can overturn that. Which is funny because I'd always been under the impression that I is to prevent coups and that sort of it thing. It is. Yeah. That's what's very funny, Doesn't right? Doesn't really work very That well. was put in place after the dictatorship. Yeah. Now, the press used this to basically push the story that this is PT shielding Lula from what should be a just arrest. Yeah. So, meanwhile, at this same time, the car wash investigators are, it, it starts spreading through the political class in Brazil that the car wash investigators now have a list of, uh, of names, 200 Brazilian politicians that they have 
that from all different parties, because, mm-hmm. you know, there's a billion, uh, that are all involved in corrupt deals and they're ready to arrest all of them mm-hmm. or, you know, start proceedings. That freaks out basically every single member of Congress okay. <laughs> in Brazil. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they are now looking at, they're basically like, who do we have to S? Whose D do we have to S to get this car wash operation to end? Because basically, I mean, this kind of happened in Italy. Yes, very uh, similar. When like everybody got arrested and was yes. like linked, except for the communists, was like linked to um, basically like, you know, influence peddling, organized yeah. crime, uh, corruption, all that kind of stuff. And so these guys were like, oh, hold on. We don't want to be Italian. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I was about to make a joke about Brazilians and Italians, but I won't. You won't. A top guy at PMDB, which is one of the political parties, he's taped telling a colleague that, quote, the guys in the Supreme Court Mm -hmm. told him. (laughs) Okay, that's an actual. He says literally the guys in the Supreme Court told him. These guys in the Supreme Court. That basically car wash and everything would continue unless Mm -hmm. Dilma is impeached, replaced by her vice president, Temer, Michael Temer, And then a national government is formed around him backing, which is backed by the Supreme Court and the army. And this guy says he's already spoken to the army and that they have his full support. Okay. This is a coup. Yeah. hundred percent. This is a coup. And this is exactly what happened. Right. So almost immediately the house, because they're all incentivized now, they're, they're freaked out. They're all going to get arrested or whatever. They immediately, literally the next day, vote to impeach Dilma, and then the Senate immediately finds her guilty on all the charges. Yeah. Um, it, you know, if you can find a video of the Senate vote and you understand Portuguese or you can find a translation, like, I highly recommend you watch this. It's really fucking disgusting to see. There's all these kind of, like, young young-ish, and some oldies, uh, Br- uh, Brazilian politicians, like, fucking holding up Bibles. And, like, I mean, it's just horrifically sexist and disgusting and, and anti... I mean, it's just anti-liberal. It's, like, so many horrible things. And this includes, of course, famously... Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro. This I remember vividly because he gave this sort of speech before his vote Yeah. where he says, they lost in 64, the coup... And now they lost in 2016. And he dedicates his vote to the memory of Colonel Carlos Alberto Brilhante Ustra, which I'm no doubt, well, it's a name. I can say it however I want. The dread of Dilma Rousseff. So that is actually the military officer who oversaw the apparatus that tortured Dilma when she was imprisoned by the dictatorship. So he is literally dedicating his vote to the guy that like like, arrested and tortured Dilma. the woman that he's impeaching. And I mean, there's a, I guess a lot of gender stuff that goes into this as well, because he had, he is, I mean, Bolsonaro is well known for his, uh, I guess, unique takes on, um, on Dilma and women in general. Yeah. Um, and so there's sort of that subtext to that as well. So remember, you know, Brazilian presidents, right? They're limited to two successive terms, but basically they can run again after that Mm -hmm. Uh, or after like a little interregnum, as people like to say. Um, So what's important to then point out is that for this coup to be successful, there had to be a double move because it wasn't just enough to get Dilma out and put Temer in. Lula needed to be imprisoned. Yeah, um, so that he couldn't run because if you're in prison, you can't run. Uh, uh unlike the U S actually. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, of course. Debs. Uh, but at, so at the time of Lula's conviction, all polling showed him as like the overwhelming front runner to win again in 2018. Um, with the criminal conviction, like I said, you know, he would be ineligible to run and that basically cleared the way for Bolsonaro. Um, so Lula gets arrested in 2018 on corruption charges that he, committed, quote, indeterminate acts. This oh. is literally what it was called. You don't want to be you don't want to be arrested for that. With zero evidence. Zero evidence is presented, but he was basically convicted by the media, yeah. right? Because this had all been primed and ready, and all of this sort of class resentment had been building in, in Brazil for so long, right? We're trying to kind of present all these different angles. Um, Lula appeals his case, 
you know, famously, of course, on habeas corpus grounds, and it goes all the way to the Supreme Court, to the very fucking building the Bolsonaristas trashed, right? This Mm -hmm. is in this building. The head of the Brazilian army says that granting Lula habeas corpus would threaten the stability of the country, and the Supreme Court votes six to five, basically barring him from running. Well, I will say, too, that a general when Lula was arrested, had a tweet drafted by Army High Command that said, the Brazilian army believes that it shares the desire of all citizens to repudiate impunity and respect the Constitution, social peace, and democracy, as well as keeping its eye on its institutional missions. So this was coordinated, right? I mean, you have the, you have the Brazilian High Command of the army writing fucking tweets for generals yes. about like, yes, this is the right thing to do. We need to arrest this guy. The fucking army. Yeah, the army working hand in hand, by the way, with the organs at, in Congress, the Supreme Court, right? The vice president who completely, I mean, absolutely knew what was going on. Demer, Demer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely yeah. Um, so in Dilma's own cabinet, in the executive, in the presidential office, again, the three buildings that were attacked January 8th, mm-hmm. and then in the media and the middle class and the upper middle class and the you know, finance and the industry, all these interests were coming together, right? I mean, this is a coup. But like I said, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the final boss that has to give its approval, good old U.S. of A., yeah. And, you know, I got to say that Brazil Wire has done a fantastic job. Great of, website. Yeah, yeah, they are um, great journalists there of putting together kind of a timeline here and piecing together through what they can of how involved the U.S. was in the coup. Yeah. And I think it's pretty, pretty damning. Um, you know, so they have, according to a leaked st- uh, State Department cable from back in 2009, This is so crazy. DOJ ran a training camp for prosecutors in Rio called Project Bridges. This is in as early as 2009. So Lula is still in power. Yeah. Sergio Mora was the keynote speaker. He must have been in his fucking 20s at the time or something. Um, And during the event, the U.S. and the Brazilian delegations discussed the possibility of beginning a joint corruption investigation located in Curitiba, which is, of course, where Operation Car Wash was located. Then in 2013, Ed Snowden reveals in that the NSA had been spying on and listening into Petrobras Not and surprising. looking in on internal communications. Um, in 2014, right, you get Operation Car Wash, and that's announced as a joint operation between the U.S. DOJ, the FBI, the SEC, and local Brazilian public prosecutors in Curitiba, along with the Brazilian federal police. And that's an important to know. The U.S. was... Like a, was the a FBI was a partner in this, yeah. in this investigation, um, and the Intercept has done a lot of reporting through basically a tranche of leaked telegram mm-hmm. communications of you know how much the U.S. was overstepping its legal bounds in its involvement in this investigation. So after the installation of the coup regime, the Temer, you know the. Uh, when Temer became president after the impeachment, the government immediately, one of the first things they do, in addition to all of the kind of classic neoliberal, I mean, they they passed a law that they froze all social spending for 20 years. Yeah. Literally, there's no social spending in, in, in Brazil for 20 years Incredible. above the rate of inflation. I mean, it's, it's a fucking uh, death spiral, right? But not just that, they... The government immediately starts selling off Brazil offshore petroleum at market rates that below market rates to Exxon and Chevron. And then they give they they pass a three hundred billion dollar tax break for foreign oil companies to come into Brazil. I mean, this shit sounds like something that you read from back when you're like, oh, we used to call them banana republics. I think too, like, wasn't there also at one point didn't the U.S. create, like, just give the prosecutors a bunch of money, too? They, like, yeah. made a foundation and put them in charge of it? Yeah. There's a whole bunch of pay-to-play stuff happening as well. Yeah. In 2017, um, acting assistant attorney general Kenneth A. Blanco, he gives a speech at the Atlantic Council, Friends of the Pod, um, Sponsors. where he basically bragged that of how, you know, how successful DOJ's quote-unquote informal 
involvement in the car wash operation was. And then, of course, the lead prosecutor, very famous guy, um, the lead prosecutor for the car wash investigations, he described Lula's 2018 arrest as literally, he says it, a gift from the CIA. Well, that's kind of, that's shooting a little straight there, right? I mean, yeah. he's being honest. But yeah, I mean, that's, 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 I think what you saw in Operation Car Wash and in the removal of Dilma and Lula from political life is a full like lawfare style coup. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And I, and I think that like that's a pretty important thing to keep in mind that a coup does not necessarily look like tanks on the Grand Boulevard. You know, a coup can oftentimes look like telegram messages or whatever mm-hmm. and between prosecutors and then, uh, you know, a bunch of people. I mean, it, it, what, what you have here is a real deal, true, no shit criminal conspiracy. Uh to get the PT out of power and then put in, well, turned out to be Bolsonaro. And, I mean, to, you know, and to what end? To free social spending, to, you know, as- reassert finance, like, structural role. That, yeah. like, just even the gains that, yes, you know, we have criticism of during PT, right? Mm-hmm. But even just... Poor people getting a little less poor was too much. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah, what I d- mean? Like, I, I don't want to be misunderstood here. Like, I like it that poor people got money. Absolutely. No, I mean, I'm. we were just trying, I think we're just trying to describe, you know, some of the structural contradictions and frustrations with yeah. these, this type of program and why it led to a collapse of the coalition. 